Hello from Sydney, Australia. I'm Margaret Brandman, composer, performer and recording artist. So moving on to your educational materials, which is a big part of your life, you have received a major award called the World Piano Teachers Association Award. And that really is testimony to all of your developments that you've really, I suppose, pioneered over the last decades, recent decades. And you've produced sheet music, you've done arranging, you've done a lot of educational materials with a unique twist. So can you just tell us about the firstly the problems that you see within piano tutoring in general and what you have done to try and solve those issues? Well, I'll talk from the point of view of when I started out teaching and I was mm -hmm. using this traditional method and the people were struggling with reading the note names, particularly on piano because you've got treble clef <clears throat> and bass clef and you get the mix up of the two names. And they were continually looking down at their hands to find the notes and the no flow in the uh, the playing because of that. Mm -hmm. And so what, what happened in my life is I was at university studying, doing composition and um, in general music, other st studies, and, and part of it was to play music in C cliff. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called scoring and it was a book from England um, preparatory exercises in scored reading you bet one hand in in the tenor clef the other hand in the bass clef the well treble clef would be, and you and um, the tutor said to me when I was going through that she said if you don't know the name of the note the only thing you can do is read the interval and then I had an aha moment because all my students were struggling with note naming and I thought what if I try an interval approach with the students mm -hmm. so that we've got anchor points we know where the c's are um, on the piano and i color code where they are and then from there it's just a distance is it one up one down and the language is step skip same i've got another mm -hmm. word for the fourth which is skip plus one because it's that's what it is a skip is line line and it's one further and a double skip is a jump so i was using that language and people could play and sing with that language and they navigate without needing to watch their hands because now you, you said something there you said something there about firstly an interval a distance of sound between two notes you could say the distance between notes that's the definition of an interval but you said singing there so playing and singing so do you get your students to try and sing the notes and then potentially play them or do you combine the two together well um in my uh, method piano method I've got it with junior primer <clears throat> if you have a line of music first of all you trace the direction of the notes and you see whether it's a step or skip then you say it with the intervals and the counting so you might go one two three four step up two three four step mm -hmm. up two skip down two I'm already pitching it um i us students just talk it, but after a while when they're doing it and playing it, they will naturally pitch. Yes. And yeah. then they can take the whole same thing and be a sight singer. Mm -hmm. So they can play, but they can also sight sing. And mm -hmm. when they're looking at a piece of music, they can hear it in their head by just following the flow of the intervals and because they've sung it and put the counting in. And it's a really neat, quick package to get all of that, the direction, the interval and the counting in one and What you're speaking about there in terms of when we look at exam syllabi, um, typical one that is used where I'm from is the ABRSM. And most exam syllabuses of that type would have examining on scales, oral tests, your pieces, your sight reading, and already you're building in the sight singing technique or skill already right there. So, I mean, your students are right ahead there. So what was the next thing you developed within your education materials? So you got that kind of figured out about the intervals and all that kind of thing. What else did you bring into it? Well, so the, the intervals then just um, as next step, step on from that is not one interval at a time. It's a bunch of intervals. So you either have a scale pattern or a bunch of skips give you a chord. Um, and then you have larger chords and you have all the different sorts of chords, seventh chords and ninth chords and things like that. So it, it's not just one interval of at a time, it's starting to bundle things together. Okay. And then the other side of things was 
how do we make scales easier? You're talking about the exams, but mm -hmm. not only for an exam, if you're improvising, you need to know your pathway on the scale of the on, on a, whatever instrument you are. In, in piano, it's sort of easy to visualize in black and white blocks. Yes. Not so easy on a violin because you yes. but yeah. everything on any instrument is space. How far do you go from here to here? But um the next aha moment I had was oh, I can show my students how to do scales easily instead of all those names of the notes and all, you know, just ladders of steps mm -hmm. with a thousand fingerings written on. That's funny, yeah. So, There's oh. scale books there. They're like that thick and they're just, you know, crazy with all the fingerings, yeah. And it, it, notationally, they all look the same. They've got a ladder up and down and the ladder yes, up and down. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, by the way... Our word scale comes from the word la scala, which means the ladder. Okay. So we are playing music layered ladders all the time. So if we think we're doing our music ladder. Um, so um, I've got a video out that I did for the World Piano Teachers Association called <clears throat> The Geometry of the Piano and the Symmetry of the Hands. And that's to do with our black and white blocks in twos and threes and the fact that our hands are opposite <laughs> they're not the same way around yeah, yeah. so um a, a lot of things are contrary are easy because we're using the same fingers at the same time mm -hmm. whereas similar is not necessarily as easy to do mm -hmm. um so i thought well how i do it on the on showing the video and, and elsewhere is you block out can you see my hands so you yes, you've got yeah. eight five notes you've got um where do we start so we're doing a major scale so we know we've got three sharps which is, I've got a rhyme for that and um, for the kids. And we use, we use uh, fast cars go down at every bend. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. for the adults, the cheeky one is Father Christmas gets drunk after every beer. <laughs> They're very Australian. <laughs> yep. Um, so I need the three of them in an F sharp, a C sharp and a G sharp. So I'll take my fingers up to the sharp and then I'll hold the whole scale down so I can see yeah. I've got that many whites and that many blacks. Mm -hmm. And then I've got the pictorial image of that in my book called Pictorial Patterns for Keyboard Scales and Chords. So you can make the connections and, and relate things. Yeah, the, and then, the thing that I've seen with students is that they struggle so much with huge list of scales. For example, if you're in the mid grades, mid to higher grades of most syllabi, that um, there's just so many scales. And if they're going through it, as you explained, the ladder pattern, you know, the typical scale book that looks like a manual, it's a tough deal to try and remember all that stuff for the average student. Yeah. Well, so in, in my pictorial patterns, I've shown in a, on a graphic how you can see all 12 major scales in one view. presentation I'll be speaking about my approach to the teaching of keyboard geography which has simplified the learning of scale and chord patterns for my students. I will offer some easy ways for students to memorize their scales. This will help them when they're playing a scale in an exam, will also help them when they're learning a piece and if they have to improvise a line without any written cues they can use the scale pathways as a guide. Firstly, here is how just one scale, the G-flat scale, is presented in most traditional scale books. The notation is quite confusing for the novice. 
The key signature of six flats at the beginning of the line of music gives little help as to where the notes can be found on the instrument. The dense look of the notation with the fingering written in for every note makes learning the scale quite difficult. Here is an interesting piece on how the brain comprehends the whole. According to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are, the only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Just amazing! Don't you agree? Now I'll show you a diagram in which the entire 12 major scales can be seen in one gestalt view. I call this the grand view. Notice how the patterns seem to grow with the addition of black notes as you go down the column. It is easy to remember each scale in turn by making connections between the patterns. Now that's one that's of the things cutting that... down a lot of, you know, blockages right there. Yep. And what I like to do in my teaching is use gestalt a lot, which means seeing the whole view of the topic mm -hmm. instead of a bit by bit by bit. So sometimes it helps to see how they all sit together and how they all relate. And yeah. I sh again, I show that in my geometry video, how it works and it's in the, in the book. The other curious things I, I found there too is you, if you put E flat major scale and E majors above, above each other, the blacks in E major become the whites in E flat major. Yeah, I call it photographic, yeah. photographic mm -hmm. negatives. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of fun exploring that, and it was sort of working with students and trying to figure out how do I get the message across. So yeah, a lot of the education materials comes from having had to find a solution. A and you know, the other around. thing is. The other thing is like students, when they see that they've got these lists of scales to do, it's very off putting. They don't want to learn that. They want to be on the fun stuff, like learning the music, performing, learning how to perform what they so dream wish to do. Um, so it's it's great. Now, um, you also have materials um, that have been picked up by examining boards. Uh, you've published pieces and syllabuses. You've developed music theory. Um, you also have oral training as well, so you have a lot there. And also you're very strong on the skill of improvisation. Could you just speak to that first about improvisation? Why or how you bring it in? Uh, well, as part of the piano method, um, we are every time you turn the page in my piano method, you're learning a new sort of chord. You get a, um, a piece demonstrating the chords. Students are required to write out what the chord names are, analyze the music, and write the chord names in. And so then you can take the chord names and you can take the actual notation away, but you can go, well, now we're going to do something with the chord progression. Yeah. And book 2A of my piano method, I explore the 1625 chord progression, which has been used in so many classical mm -hmm. pieces and also in pop music. Um, Neil Sedaka, when he wrote a lot of his music O'Carroll and pieces like that in the 1960s started to use those four chords a lot. So you hear those, the, and there are many tunes that like, like that chord progression. Yeah. Um, so learning the chords and having to make the connection on the keyboard, um, I've got to go from a C chord to an F chord. What's my common note? How far do I, my fingers move? Again, you use the step skip language. My This one's moving up a step. This one's moving down a step. This is my, moving up a skip. So your interval language helps you navigate chords as well. Mm. You've got your sound of the chords. I work in, I do what's called a chord table through my piano books where we lay out in fifths. So your tonic is here and your dominant is fifth up and the subdominant is fifth down. 
and um, we put the relative minors underneath. So that's my invention in my um, piano methods. I don't think anyone's seen that anywhere where before. I've never seen it in any other yeah. piano methods. Mm -hmm. um, and we color code it as well, so that makes it fun. And then, so you've got your chords, and then you need to know what scale to run over the top of it. So back to our scales, being able to play a scale without reading the notation is important. Yes. So that A major scale that we did, we need to be able to scoot up and down the piano without um, mm. reading it. And that's one of the good reasons for learning it for an exam anyway, because they don't want you to read it. They want you to play scales from mm -hmm. memory. Yeah. Um, and also with the scale work, if you can um, look at the relative minors and one of the things that I teach as a foundation thing is the natural minor scale. Now, did you do that in your ABRS? No, it was all harmonic versions, melodic versions. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, I've got to do a harmonic minor and I've got to do this raised seventh. And I said, what are you raising it from? You need mm -hmm. to know what your starting point was before you know what to raise. So I do natural. So when they're practicing the scales, natural harmonic back and do another natural to get your bearings and then melodic after that okay so, yeah. so that's why it I sounds do it. it sounds like though that you're increasing the capacity for learning what i'm trying to say is students are going to learn quicker because you're really making it more pictorial more visual more kind of pulling it together more in a conducive context if you know what i mean very cohesive would i be right in that assumption Absolutely, because again, this gestalt thing, we, we want to see the whole thing fairly quickly. You don't want to spend 10 years getting there. Yes. Um, but yes. one of the things I one of my things I demonstrate on the video is playing the 12 major scales, only one octave each, up and down, pick out the chord, go up a fifth and get your next scale. So you're going to do your scales in order, one sharp, two sharp, three sharps, and you run out of the piano at, at F sharp because it's, you know, and then yeah. go back down and do that D flat and you come back to the center. And I show that in the video, you, know, you can do that in under two minutes. So everyone can cope with all their scales in such a short, much shorter that's, time. That's a gift, that's a gift, because I can't tell you how many times I've seen students looking at this list going, oh my goodness, I don't want to do an exam. This is too much. You know, yeah. and it takes forever then to learn. Um, uh, moving on, I music. Up, yeah. I just want to jump there because then from those scale patterns, you can also derive the modes. Okay. You're not, not going to be only stuck with harmonic, minor, and melodic. You're going to be able to find your modes. And again, it's another one. I, all my I tricks suppose as well, guitar. you know, when you speak about all the chords, you mentioned sevenths, ninths, all this, that... Um, that is also going to be fantastic for somebody who loves jazz music of all the genres, jazz music uh, or any kind of Latin music that that skill being built in is positioning them so well to start entering that world because that's a whole genre to itself. Yeah. It and really don't is. forget that Bach was the first jazz musician and he's got all these wonderful chords um, through his music. And if you start to analyze the chord progressions and figure out instead of playing da 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 you play it as a block chord, block chord, block chord. Yes. You yeah. speed learn the music, you're hearing what the chord progression is. Um, and then you have a look at what Beethoven did, and then you look how Chopin did the chords and uh, and then the melody so lines, how they brought in melody and how they made it so beautiful and the phrasing and yeah, it's it's yeah. it's fascinating and you connect you connect all the styles of music through those tools that you yeah. they all modern music and Bach's music all use scales they all use chords let's find out what the connection is and how many of these chords they share and where we've gone from that and then bring it into the popular genres like pop music and so forth same deal yeah. chord roots yeah. um music theory how do you bring that in well, I, again, I've written my uh, own books called uh, Contemporary Theory Workbooks, and there's a primer where, again, with a, a colour coding for learning rhythms, um, easy for the little ones and intervals, and then there's a, a book one and book, book two, which cover all the basics, the scales, the chord, um, understanding, major, minor, uh, major, minor, uh, diminished, augmented and suspended fourth chords in the first book. And okay. I said to my one of my students 
10 year old, I said, what are the chords? He said, major, minor, argumented and demolished. <laughs> argumented and demolished. That's excellent. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> So you get, you get these wonderful things back from the students. So. Yeah, and then they stimulate you to create more. That's the thing. And yeah. oral training. You also, I think, have books for oral training. Yeah, I've, I'll finish the theory bit because okay. we've got those, those ones. Um, books one and two. I'll do modes in the second one and the seventh chords. In the chord, then I've got a chord workbook series. I've got one and two in the chord workbooks, which is honing in on what how to write the chord where you find it in the scale what what uh, it, where it sits in the in the key and what mode will go over that chord so for people going on to their jazz and to other things this is um very solid um two foundation books. Mm -hmm. first book goes to the sevenths and second book does ninths elevenths and thirteenths so right into the jazz right there. in there yeah and then and sorry and then I've, I've written a book called harmony comes together which well, is i was i harmony. was i was just going to lead into people who want to actually write music learn how to write music i presume you're covering that i in four part harmony creation yes but also right through the piano method because i've written the piano myth method as a, from the point of view of both a performer and a composer. Okay. So I'd okay. like to show if every time you turn a page, this is a new type of chord. This is here where you would find it. Here's a piece that I either I've written or somebody else has written that mm -hmm. uses these chords. And I'm training people to be composers all the way. So it's not like a separate thing you have to do. It's as part of becoming a, a, a rounded pianist. A rounded so, musician. Sounds yeah. absolutely an amazing syllabi. Um, now, oral training, oh, big, de oh. big deal, oral training. Um, have you something else you want to add? Uh, no, you're going to go on yeah. to your own. Okay, so oral training. Oral training I have seen has challenged a lot of students that I have seen. And, you know, when you think of the mid-higher grades, it is quite challenging. If that student hasn't really started doing oral training from day one, particularly, it's a skill you build, build, build. And in my own story, a bit like yours, you know, you had the recorder and other instruments to really help develop your ear. I didn't just do piano um, and it helped my ear to develop in a strong way. So I'm just wondering, firstly, what tools have you to help students and secondly how would you advise somebody that mightn't be very good with their oral skill how could you advise them to you know strengthen it okay can i first of all tell you my little family story i was about five and i'd been learning the accordion since i was four and my mother was teaching in the front room because of our music studios in the house and she would play a note on the piano in the front room and i say that's a G. And she says, how do you know it's a G? I'd be in the kitchen. And I'd tell her what note she was playing. And she, we discovered that I had perfect pitch and we'd make a game out of it. And she would just wander off two rooms away, play a note, play a chord, and I'd tell her what it was. So <laughs> fortunately, with all this early music around me, that I developed the, the, the sense of perfect pitch, which you need to be able to know what a G is so you can say, well, mm -hmm. that sounds like a G. Yeah. So then... My experience was going to the Conservatorium of Music High School where I was totally immersed in music with everything we were doing. And we were fortunate to have music theory and oral lessons maybe two hours a week or even more. And I thought, well, how can I get this across for my own students once, you know, they're not, they're not at a specialist high school, they're just ordinary students. How can we get enough time on oral so I decided to uh, develop my own course where it was a voiceover. It trains you what what interval to listen for um, or what the rhythm is and you need to clap it. And then you need to uh, have a set of books where you write down the answers. So we've now got audio files that, that can be bought and downloaded and it has a, a workbook and the workbook okay. has the answers in in case the parents want to check. Um, but that can all be done takes the load out of the lesson time, can be done at home several times a week, not just once a week. You can't train your ear once a week. No, you can't. It's an ongoing skill. Mm -hmm. And I start right from day one. So when my students come in and they get the junior primer of the Red Book in my series, 
with my little koala character called Dexter all the way through, um, they also get their oral um, book. And yes, right from day one. So what we're getting what's high and low, and we do actions with it, you know, so it's fun for the kids yeah. to do. And we do clapping and listening. And that oral course has the preparatory level and another eight levels. So in the in the last two, it's called hear your chords and hear more chords. And I'm covering the same chords that I talked about in the chord workbook okay. from the oral point of view. But okay. it's not just a series of questions. It's training and a very pleasant voiceover. We got this lady, um, I did it originally, and we wanted to release it in America. And they said, oh, you sound too Australian. <laughs> Thank goodness, too Australian. Yeah, so we got a lady with a lovely, who she does television here in Australia, and she's got a what I call a transatlantic voice, and she's doing my voiceover. But I'm playing all the music for it. Oh, so. beautiful, beautiful. So it should be and, accessible. Any, um, just a question that's leading into this is practice. Now, many students have asked me in the past and asked and figure, you know, they'd be trying to figure out how much time is this going to take? I'm a busy person. How much, you know, yes. how long should I practice every day? I'm a beginner. I'm an intermediate, I'm more advanced. So how do you answer those questions? Well, you can you can learn quickly and efficiently um, if you put in some of my strategies, put it that way. So it, mm -hmm. you can practice, you can practice the things and get them more quickly with some some of these strategies that I've developed. Um, but for my little ones, I just have the two, two, two formula. So we've yeah. just got a piece of music, two right hand, two left hand, two together. But also before doing two hands together, we do a little thing which I call finger tracing. So you've got what I call crocodile fingers and it's, you use your left hand and you track whether the music's going up together, down together, out or in. You see the patterns and children don't actually see very well. Mm -hmm. or don't take in what's there but once they touch the page and relate with their fingers they start to see the patterns yes and things. yes yeah so that's and my I, strategy that i use yeah i also think as well you know the way the world has gone now with technology everything is so visual so touch based you know like touch screen like that the more of that that's included in how one tutors it's it's more effective that's what people yeah. now are used to rather than reading a tongue load um a parent is wondering uh i want my children to have music in their lives and i don't know much about the music world or what i should look out for what would you advise a parent um well we're, we're talking a particular instrument or in general instrument? like in how general. to include music into their life how do they go about it well first of all you've got to allow the time you got to you got to make sure that that's important to you and the family, and that with a child that you, you've got to give them support. Um, I just don't find it very effective if if a parent sort of just delivers this child, to like child money to a teacher, and they take off, yeah. and they're not concerned. Or no, we just let the teacher do it all. The the parents that come along to my lessons, I. Actually, I won't even teach a young one without a parent being around because a five and six-year-old is not going to remember what you've said. You need no, another parent. No, no. Mm -hmm. you need so you need someone to help organise the practice and make sure things are followed through. So if you want to bring music in as a study, at least for the first six to months to a year, the parent needs to be there and involved and happy to be a sounding board or another pair of ears or come into the lesson and sit at the back and just observe. observe. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But some parents, I actually get them playing it themselves and they go, oh, it, it, it looked easy, but I don't, now I know what my child is understanding because they, they've got to try and do it themselves. And they, yes. what looking from the back, you think, oh, that's going to be easy. But as soon as you try and do it for yourself and you really there's a different level of understanding to it and I have found myself personally is encouraging them to attend concerts now that of course COVID pandemic is passing and things are coming back I have found it so um, motivational for the student and the parent actually to go on a combined outing to a special concert 
and they come back and they're invigorated. They go, oh, it was great. And this happened and that happened. Now I really want to play. And, yes. um, you know, the more of that real life experience that's brought into it, making it a bigger, bigger world rather than this small world in the studio is it's very effective. And that's where probably learning an instrument that is um, an orchestral instrument it, as an adjunct, if you're doing piano, if you do, mm -hmm. do clarinet or flute or one of those other instruments where you've got the social thing of being in a band and or an orchestra at school mm -hmm. and you've got, that's another aspect of what makes music fun. Is the, oh, um, totally, yeah. I mean, just two things I want to complete this section on and it's firstly about pop music. Um, before we started recording this um, part of the interview, we spoke about the downside of playing pop music as it happens on piano. Pop music is very studio created with a group of instruments. And then when you try and use arrangements for piano, they can be very empty sounding, not the thing, you know, and they take away the beauty of what was created in a studio that everybody loves. So what have you done to try and come around that issue? Well, um. Um, what I did many years ago, I was employed as an arranger to um, do a whole series and they were called Easy Piano Pops and Simply the Best. And I was uh, given Elton John music or um, I was just saying Wind Beneath My Wings, or, you know, things that actually had a, a decent melody to work with. And I, I arranged them so that they would... Um, sound melodious and they would have good chords in it and they would have some um, classical techniques in it as well. Um, but uh, um, I know this is like the, the 80s and the 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there were a lot of good Beatles tunes or um, melodies written that were strong melodies that you could do things with. And I do hear a lot of the stuff these days, which is a studio created, and it's all created on the on machinery. It's not created on a proper mm -hmm. instrument anyway. It's on the what do they call um, one of those programs that that you know you just you have a line and you just it's a timeline works on a yeah. timeline. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. and they can do effects and they can do all of that. But where is the strong melody that mm. you can grab onto? To make a piano arrangement out of that's yeah. the that's the issue really so in other words you've got to choose pop music with melody for it to really apply well to piano and on one other thing then um in relation to group playing um you're a pianist and i suppose well what i've seen i'll speak to my own experience is that as a pianist you're stuck to your piano in your room practicing you can't actually carry a big piano with you and take it to a group situation and so on Whereas if I have a violin, a guitar, ukulele, something like this, you just basically stick it in your bag, off you go to your group situation. So how important is it to include group work and how soon do you like to introduce that into a student's experience? Well, from my own point of view, I, I've done so many gigs myself and I've been lugging Yamaha pianos around. And, um, I, I, if, if there's a piano needed, I'd take my own. So I, I've done that myself. Um, with my own students, just because of my my studio is small, I don't do group lessons so much. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I have been working with my Barnes colleague Bob Dylan, and we go to the school, and he's got a, a string ensemble, and I've been coaching and working with them to play my pieces, which has been actually really good fun to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a lot of teachers do group piano this that and the other but I I'm just not myself not set up to do that and but um, is there you know when you think about group lessons for instruments in general I I think there's a for and an against in that discussion because you have all this like one-on-one -on -one time where there's a lot of knowledge being shared and it's very hard then to take a student from that situation and teach them in a group situation. I would imagine the group situation is more for ensemble work after you have your private work done. I would, I would agree that that would be the way to do it because particularly with piano, you need to be individually like a hawk as a piano teacher, watching hand position, mm -hmm. um, making sure the you know fingers are curved. There are so many aspects yeah. just watching one child and I wouldn't like to have say five children all 
chunking along, you know, playing a mm. fairly easy something or other and ha having no time to make sure that their hand position was right or, um, and, you know, they get away with sort of murder with a lot with that, with that sort of stuff. And, but the quality oh, yeah, wouldn't be in this. Yeah, We're playing a bit of a tune here, but we don't. Then, then those sort of people have come to me and said we've had these sorts of lessons, and then you've got to do a lot of remedial mm -hmm. to get go backwards them. to go forward. Yeah, so okay. I tend to be a hawk and just watch everything my students doing the whole time, that whole Great. whole half hour. You're, you're you're really focused on every every aspect of what they're doing. Yeah, I, I I would totally agree with you on that. There's too much detail. Now we're going to move on to compositions. Now I'll take a break. Don't forget to visit Margaret's website at margaretbranmanmusic.com where you can purchase her music educational materials. Join us for the next part of this interview series with Margaret where she speaks about her compositions, the albums that she has created, and also interestingly, the methods which she uses to compose.